What if there was a different way to live and work? Beyond the hustle and hype, beyond the never-ending race to get more, more clients, more money, more audience, a way that's nourishing, grounded, creative, connected, and still makes a major impact in the world. You're listening to Wellpreneur with me, your host, Amanda Cook. Join me as we explore alchemy and action for entrepreneurs who want to do well and be well. Hello, and welcome back to the Wellpreneur podcast. Perfectionism, upper limits, feeling worthy, not feeling clear about what you're doing. These are issues that come up again and again for us as Wellpreneurs. It almost seems like a cycle, right? You clear one of those, like you get over some perfectionism, you break through some limiting beliefs, you start to get clear on what you're doing. And then six months later, you're right back in it. Not exactly the same. You're at another level, but it's the same issue coming up again and again. Today's guest, Joe Tucker, is really passionate about helping entrepreneurs to move through these challenges that come up for us throughout our business. And her approach is that actually perfectionism and upper limits and lack of clarity, all that stuff, it's not just a personality quirk or flaw, however you look at it. It's actually a trauma response. And she has some systems and strategies for how you can approach these challenges as you're growing your business and how to heal them and move through them. I think you're really going to like this because these are issues that pretty much every entrepreneur deals with. And so we can always use some more strategies to really clear them and move forward so that we can have the flow and ease and growth that we want in our life and business. Speaking of flow, if you would like to find your flow and shift your life and your work into a way that just feels easier and more flowing so that you don't have to buckle down or work harder or have more self-discipline in order to really create what you want in your life and business, if that sounds appealing, I've got a free six-day mini course for you. It's six days of bite-sized rituals, remedies, and actions to help you get more done with ease. Ah, it feels good. It's called Find Your Flow, and you can sign up for it at wellpreneur.com slash flow. It's totally free, um, and I put it together because I wanted to share some of my main tools and, like I said, rituals and remedies and actions to help you shift from forcing into flow. It's really good. So again, you can get that at wellpreneur.com slash flow. Now let's get into this interview with Joe Tucker. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me, Amanda. I'm so excited to be here. So tell us what it is that you do. So I work with women um, who have gone through either a great grief or are just experiencing more or less blocks towards what it is that they're looking to create in their lives, whether it is in their businesses and their families. And they've tried all the things, you know, they've read the books, they've worked with different coaches and things just haven't been moving. So we work through a somatic process. Um, so it's really trauma informed, energetically based. Reiki is my home base, my foundation. So that's integrated in. And we work on just getting their bodies online with the kind of success or their definition of success that they're looking to create in their world. Mm. Awesome. I love Reiki and all that energy work and everything. And I love how that can infuse into the right-brained world of business. Um, is that right? Left-brained, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> all the brain. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> Semantics, when it comes down to it, it's like the whole body, right? Let's get the mm -hmm. whole body online. Let's go down to the cellular level and just like wring things out that no longer work and really just get our bodies attuned to whatever it is that we define as success. And that's going to be different across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So tell us a bit about your journey and how you got started doing this work. Yeah. Um, so this is always an interesting question because you're always, I'm always thinking, what's the entry point really? You know, life is a series of different events, but I was introduced to Reiki in high school by an exchange student. Um, so that kind of planted a seed around this. Like I'd always felt like that child who was just a little bit different. Like I imagine that we all had like this kind of destiny, um, but we also had free will and um, always saw myself as greater than my human existence, um, which was a weird thing for a, a small child. My family definitely like reacted strangely towards my ideas of the world. 
And so Reiki, getting to know that outside of um, just like the very straightforward and narrow version of the life that I'd been living, kind of opened this little seed for me. And it planted it all those years ago. And it was actually only asked to bloom much later on in life in my early 20s when I really tragically lost my father. Um, He died really quickly and out of nowhere with no warning. And that led to a process of just like basically a crumbling because I realized painfully that I had no tools. I thought I had totally accepted his death and it was totally fine and it made complete logical sense. Um, But then the emotional side was never tended to. And so that led into a period of deep destabilization in my life, going from a lot of high anxiety to completely numbing out all the time, just trying to deal, um, which then led me down this path of starting to explore all of this. So getting back into Reiki, meditation and mindfulness as a way to try and find some sort of flooring underneath me. And then working through um, working with a coach and seeing a therapist and all of those just planted seeds until... And this last, I guess it's been about five years that I've um, been in business. And my business at that time that started is completely different to what it looks like now as I've gathered, as we do, more tools, more things that resonate, work with more mentors. Um, That big death was a catalyst. And then I just recently lost my mother in the last year and a half. Again, very tragically, very quickly. Um, but this one, unfor- they're like very macabre bookends to have in my life, but they're really interesting points of perspective to see how much has changed for me and in my life and my emotional capacity and resilience. Um, and so I'm feeling even more drawn towards getting these messages out, getting this work out so that we can feel stability in this chaos. Because if we look around, the world is totally, it's totally nuts. So how do we How do we live in that? How do we build businesses? How do we build families with Mm -hmm. resilience and strength behind them? Yeah. Mm. One of the reasons I really wanted to have you on and have this conversation is because is your take on the idea of perfectionism and Mm -hmm. some of these mindset things that we talk a lot about in like entrepreneur circles, like upper limit and limiting beliefs and and perfectionism is a huge one I know for so many people listening. Um, And your perspective on it is actually that's not just a personality trait, but it's actually a trauma response. Well, first of all, to talk about trauma, I think we're coming into a space in our like cultural, I don't know, what's the word here, lexicon where trauma is no longer super traumatic to hear, right? When we hear the word trauma, we think that it has to be this huge thing that happened in our lives. Um, And often it's these smaller, more nuanced moments that can create imprints in our system. So the idea behind um, trauma and an trauma-informed lens on this world is that we all have this blueprint for health within our systems. It's what we access when we're accessing Reiki. It's this universal life force energy Um, And I don't know anyone that's living in a perfect blueprint. I think that would be really complicated and hard here on this planet and this iteration of humanity. But this blueprint is always here. And it's this force that's like seeking out transformation, change, love, joy, all of the goodness in our lives that we in this blueprint can receive openly and fully. And then in our lives, in this human experience, we also have these imprints on our blueprint and those um, are the harder bits of life, the death and the grief, or maybe the abuse, the neglect. For a lot of us, it's not ever having learned how to be with our emotional body. It's the war on bodies for women. It's all of these big and small moments. Those can be imprinted on our bodies and they live within our systems. And some of them are systems that we've lived through and some of them are the systems that our families have lived through. Mm. More and more the science of epigenetics can show, you know, that the legacy of trauma lives within our systems, in our cells, and those are passed down through our bodies into our generations, right? So we have this intergenerational trauma that we're also looking at. Um, And so for me, as I was saying to you beforehand, having this map for this blueprint, and the blueprint looks like you know, being able to receive fully, having our worthiness intact and internally dialed up, um, feeling sovereign, expressing ourselves fully, and all of this in safety 
and clarity with choice. And so that's like the beauty of the blueprint. It's like this heart opening, gorgeous state of being. And then the imprints are like, oh, procrastination and perfectionism. They can be bigger imprints, of course, but these are the smaller, more almost insidious ones that can creep in the more nuanced places um, that we often think of as, oh, that's just like a personal problem. Oh, I have no willpower. Oh, like, I guess that's just who I am. But they're actually, these parts of our personality are changeable. They're malleable because we have neuroplasticity. We can change the way we feel and think about things. Um, not just through mindset work, but through attuning the entire body towards the blueprint where everything can feel good and easy er, right? Mm -hmm. Not ever perfect, but, you know, we can feel more capacitated. We can feel more resilient there. So, yeah. It's interesting. Things like that, um, you know, when you talk about traumas, there's almost, I guess I'm thinking of an example of my own life. I've done quite a bit with EFT, like um, emotional mm -hmm. freedom technique and energy work. And mm -hmm. I had a memory come back from when I was like seven years old in school where a teacher mm -hmm. said something to me and it, I'm sure she didn't remember it. It was just a passing comment, but it was like hugely traumatic. And when I mm -hmm. uncovered this memory, it was like this huge emotional release that really shocked me, like how much emotion had been stuck in my body around that memory. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's really when you, the way you just explained how this stuff can live in our body and it really makes sense how like perfectionism and upper limits and limiting beliefs, you could just have something small, well, in air quotes, small happen to you when you're younger. And it, it just creates this huge blockage throughout your yep. life. It's amazing. Yeah, it just sits in it, in your body. And the thing with trauma that I think is harder for people to understand, especially for women when we're like, oh, it's not, you know, it's not that big of a deal, is that it's not, trauma isn't actually about the event. Everyone can experience the same events, but it, how rather it sits in our bodies. And that's a largely based on like our ancestral DNA, but also just like the environment that we're growing up in. Um, and so everyone takes everything differently. And that's, I think, the hard thing about trauma is that, yeah, it, it can be. I mean, not to use like the worst pop culture moment, but um, Grey's Anatomy does a lot of talking about trauma these days. And they have one character and he was like, oh, it must have been the war. It must have been this thing. Well, no, it was this one time when he won this award and he came home and something awful had happened in his family. And so he felt shame for feeling so good when something bad had happened for his mother. Something so small like that mm. imprints in our system and just creates these ripple effects. You know, we all hopefully observe patterns in ourselves that we get stuck in these patterns or the same thing happens over and over. But I'm really interested in exploring this idea of the ancestral patterns too and mm. what's been inherited. And I guess what you were saying is that based on what's happened in your ancestral line, that could make you more or less apt to be affected by to store that type of trauma in your body? Yeah. There's more studies coming out now, particularly around um, people who have been through the Holocaust. And we can actually see that the lineage that follows those survivors has imprints in their DNA. Their cellular structure has been changed. And so what does that mean for our bodies? Um, it means that, you know, not only are we living with these stories um, and the ways of being, but we're we're living with that trauma in our systems. What it comes down to is that we don't need to necessarily go back and, you know, have you ever tried to like change the way your mother is? <laughs> That's not always like the most fruitful expedition. Um, but rather when we do the work on ourselves, that embodied somatic movement, the feeling of the things like we don't have to, we can have ancestral amnesia. We cannot even remember all of these things. But the work that we do here in our bodies ripples back into our ancestors and what changes in our ancestors also then ripples forward. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like playing with this time-space continuum that we live with here. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we can do that. Some people work specifically with ancestral trauma and they have lots of rituals around that with altars and integrating unhealthy ancestors and really getting deep within it. My practice 
more looks like inviting my ancestors in as I'm doing my own healing work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so intuitively, we can feel into what feels safe, what feels good, what feels doable. Those are like the big rules around trauma resolution from a body-based perspective. Um, and so like exploring different modalities with different people, seeing how our bodies feel, because it's all about safety, right? For some of us, inviting our parents in to help us heal is like, oh, my goodness, no, thank you. Like, those people, they're crazy. <laughs> or like, those people have caused enough harm. Like, I want to just do this on my own. And so the biggest part of trauma resolution is finding what feels good and safe and doable within your own body. And I think that's where perfectionism um, and these larger patterns, like so often we feel ashamed of them or we just want to like push them aside and push through is one of the major ways that we deal with perfectionism when we see it from a, as like a personality problem. Oh, just push through. Oh, just change your mindset. You know, like, but trauma isn't about logic. It's about the actual visceral feeling in our body. So then whatever it takes to tend to that so that we can compassionately be with it and it can transform, that's the key to, I guess, our liberation there. Mm. Do you have some, or could you share some strategies on um, if we start to notice, well, just how to, we can start to deal with this or notice it and deal with it a little bit on our own? I guess the first mm -hmm. step would probably be being aware of what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How do you, what would you recommend? Yeah. So from the get-go, I think it's important to also, um, I guess, even rename or reconceptualize what perfectionism or procrastination are. I like to call them misguided self-love. And so they're these beautiful, natural responses that come forward in a way of protecting ourselves. And so if we view them as not the enemy and rather as family or part of ourselves, then we have to... Uh, I think the approach changes. It's not like a batten down the hatches, push everything out, but rather a, how can we come a little bit closer? How can we get to know and explore what exactly this tendency or this pattern is seeking? And sometimes procrastination is okay, right? Sometimes it's because um, the system is overloaded. Actually, I would say always the system is overloaded and we're just trying to protect and resource. Like this is too big. We need to step back. We need to like resource ourselves better. And I'll talk about what resourcing means because that's, I think, one of the key things that we can start with. But just seeing it as like, oh, this is a gentle nudge to just back off for a minute and get some space. So what does that mean? Sometimes feeling our bodies is really hard. And I really want to acknowledge that because there's... I think, a push in society for particularly women to divorce themselves from their bodies. Um, intuition is sometimes hard to find because we're not taught that in school and we're often not taught it in our families. And so for me, the first thing after, okay, this is not something to hate. Maybe this is something to love. So how do we go about loving this, giving it space, tending to it? is we want to really resource. Resourcing is a huge word in trauma therapy. And what does that mean? It means that a skyscraper can grow really tall, but um, like a tree in a big wind, it can fall because the base of support isn't there. So what we want to do is build this base of beautiful presence and support for ourselves so that when these hard bits, these triggers come forward in procrastination and perfectionism, we have the capacity to actually be with them tend to them, understand what it is that they're asking for. And so resourcing means, yeah, how can I build this like great, huge base of support to support my momentum of health and wellness and success? Mm -hmm. And that looks like building presence. So really starting to tune into our bodies, whether that's through a yoga practice, Reiki, EFT, just getting really close and up personal with our bodies um, maybe it's dancing and movement, but a lot of it is actually working on building capacity to be with our emotional states outside of crisis. And mm. that's like, um, that takes a willingness, a reparenting, um, to show up and be like, everything's good. And I'm going to intentionally stir, stir some stuff up. 
so that I can start feeling my resilience more. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I love that that term, um, reparenting too. I'd love to talk a bit more about that. But yeah, that makes sense that that we want to start building that yeah that resilience and that those that resource and kind of flexing the muscle, I guess, to get used to to you know exploring those emotions and sitting with them. That makes sense. What does mm-hmm. um, reparenting look like? Um, it looks like a lot of different things, <laughs> depending on where it is that you're looking for more parenting. For me, um, where am I at in the stage of my reparenting right now? Calling in a little bit more discipline. So before, in my family, I grew up in a family where feeling my emotions was um, not allowed. They, it felt like my emotions were weapons. They immediately had a huge impact on my mother caused chaos in the family and therefore created this story around, um, I'm like a shit disturber. So I learned to like completely numb out. And so the first step in my reparenting was actually allowing myself to feel. So taking that space, I had a practice of sitting down and being like, okay, I'm going to give myself five minutes to just feel my body and feel what is going on and just experience it in small sips. That was the first stage of that reparenting. Um, A next stage would have been, okay, now that I'm feeling some things, I'm starting to wake up needs. Needs are a huge part of of reparenting because they're directly related to our worthiness. If we can't feel our needs and feel like those needs are worthy of being met, it's hard to then express yourself fully and safely. It's hard to have boundaries. Um, And so the next step for me was like, okay, now I'm waking up some needs and I actually need to start asking myself to meet them and show up for myself. I need to keep promises to myself. I need to call in some community to help support me in small and doable ways. And so now it looks like discipline. You know, I had to do all this big feeling and now I have to be like, okay, feelings also don't run my life. I can't allow my feelings to just take over. So I need to actually be and show up in radical responsibility around them. I need to actually feel them. I can't numb them anymore. I can't just push them away. And then I need to follow through. So what are some commitments that I'm making towards my goals? Because for a while, you know, goal setting can be highly impacted by trauma. If things feel unclear and uncluttered in my life, I lost two of my parents and multiple friends really tragically. So to dream into being into the future felt like, why would I even do that? I don't have any control. I don't have any power here. I don't have any capacity. So really starting to dip my toes back into goal setting, making decisions, having some real discipline around how I show up in my business. That's reparenting for me now. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think Mm -hmm. I've I hadn't thought about it in that term, but like one energetic thing that I play with is sometimes I'll go back and meet a version of my younger self and Mm. then I'll kind of be the big sister to her that I wish I had had or the aunt or the parent or something and kind of interact in that way or talk through her feelings or just kind of acknowledge what she's going through. And I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's a type of reparenting. I'd never thought of it in that term, but I found it really helpful. It's like, oh, I can take my, all this life wisdom I've learned and go back and like help myself (laughs) when I was younger. Yeah, exactly. And it's all about like when it comes to looking at our different developmental stages, like that infancy is all about having the space to be safe. Safety is huge there. So if you're feeling unsafe, that's the kind of reparenting you want to seek. Mm -hmm. And in childhood, it's about being able to play and have adventures. In teenagehood, it's about taking risks, really finding out who you are and what you stand for, like shocking people. And if we haven't had those stages, that's where we want to go back and do the reparenting around. So it'll change, right? Mm. I have some practices Mm -hmm. with my, I call my mom and dad in during Reiki and just ask them to hold me. Mm. Um, Something that felt so unsafe in our human existence. But now without the barriers of that humanity, inviting their energetics in feels soothing and is really great for those moments where I just, you know, I feel in my body, like the instinct is like, I just want to lay on the floor and throw a tantrum, right? Okay, instead of making that bad, how can I do that in a way that's responsible and in a way where I can show up for myself? Mm. That's reparenting, I find, yeah. 
I like, I was reading some of your posts, um, on your, on Instagram and you were talking about how, like, you still have a relationship with your parents, even Mm -hmm. though they're not living on earth anymore, you know? And like this concept of soul pack, I think you called it soul packs. Like Mm -hmm. there's sets of souls that we kind of keep showing up and playing different roles in each other's lives in different incarnations. And I think that's so like really powerful and beautiful that you continue that relationship and continue that work with Mm -hmm. them. And it wasn't always that way. That was early on in the stage of that reparenting was like a a therapist that I was seeing. He was this like wonderful, like little Buddhist guy, had a bit of a like Eckhart Tolle vibe. Um, And he was like, Joanne, like, do you ever invite your father into your life? And I was like, no, I would. No, I never do that. And so it started by like, okay, dad, like we're going to go grocery shopping today. Hmm. I want you to come and see my life. I want you to be with me. Um, and, and I'm not someone who necessarily feels like this visceral. There are people that are like, oh, I feel them in the room. I get that sometimes in Reiki, but it's often an active invitation. And I think that's based on our own relationship that we had in our lives where they don't necessarily feel comfortable to just show up because they know I'd be like, get out of here. You know, like this is not an invitation, but the active invite is what brings them closer. And that's what works for me in my life. Mm. Um, and it's been such a gift, particularly like I lost my father at such a young age. We didn't get to know each other into adulthood and with my mother and how complicated that relationship was. It's interesting to call her in and call in that kind of love that was so hard to accept in her human form. Yeah. Mm hmm. So obviously I was like scrolling around on your Instagram and (laughs) and reading some things, but one post that really jumped out at me was about hyper socialization. Like, do you mm. hyper socialize? And that's another term I didn't know. I mean, hadn't come across before. And as I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is such <laughs> like, yes, I've done all of these things. Um, can you just explain a little bit about what that is and, and how we can deal with that? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a really common thing for women to do um, in a trauma response. We have hypo and hyper a ways of reacting. Fight and flight um, are two of the more common hypo responses, but women aren't, or hyper responses rather, women aren't necessarily fighters. Um, The way that our society is kind of structured in a power sense, it's not always safe to fight. And we do have fighters, but instead what we tend to do is we do this hyper socialization. So that's on the hyper side of things. So it's like, I called it the Joanne dance, where I'd be like tapping my shoes, like, how can I make this better for everyone but me? You know, like, how can I like soothe this out? How can I be the peacemaker? How can I make everything okay and avoid conflict because conflict is unsafe? And I'm safe here. If everyone's safe, then it's going to be safe. And it's this hyper socialization of like putting everyone else's needs before your own, you know, going out of your way to make everyone more comfortable and never even considering that you have your own needs, wants, and desires, let alone that they're worthy of actually being met as well, in a nutshell. Yeah. Oh, man. So that's one of those patterns then that if people notice those kind of behaviors, like that could be something that is a trauma response that we could work with through energy work and Reiki and all of those things. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Spending time with it, getting close to it, you know, seeing it as like, oh, you know, oh, that tender Joanne, like she exhausted herself trying to be someone else for other people. And that's like, oh, can we like just be a little tender towards that poor girl? And and a lot of these strategies that we've developed um, work so well, you know, they're instinctual strategies that we develop as kids when we don't have like the higher cognition. And so those patterns are running our lives. And then we reach this point, usually in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, where we're like, wait a minute, like, when did all of this happen? (laughs) Sometimes it happens, we notice it because we have built this beautiful life and we can't enjoy it. We've built these beautiful businesses and and taken these leaps and all of a sudden we're like completely stuck and frozen. We, you know, realize that, especially around Christmas, it's a great time to talk about like how we do that dance to try and make everyone happy but ourselves. And eventually the system within us, the adult within us is like, this isn't working anymore. And so it's not about changing who you are. It's about learning new tools to be with yourself so that we can transform those patterns naturally into something that's much more regenerative. Mm. 
So what do you wish um, everybody listening knew about trauma and the potential to, you know, the ways we can actually work with this and clear it? I wish that everyone knew that it's not complicated to heal. It's actually an intrinsic part of our system. It lives within us. Our capacity to heal is so great. We just need to meet it and learn the language. And it's not complicated. It might be a bit difficult, might be a bit hard, but it's just so life-giving. And at the just like just under the surface of our skin lies so many miracles just waiting to happen. And and we just, yeah, uh, we just have the capacity for so much more. Mm. I'm curious, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that your business has really evolved over the past five years. And mm. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know that's a really common theme for wellpreneurs, that as we do more of the work and as we get more in alignment with our true selves, then our work shifts. So what's that mm -hmm. journey been like for you? Yeah. So when I first got into coaching, it was definitely edgy for me to hop into that and hop into that role. Um, but it was very much like a traditional kind of coaching style, um, more uh, talk based, more mindset based. And that's like a huge part of me. Like I'm a scientist by trade. Um, I'm a social scientist. And so that part of like the mind, the intelligence aspect of everything is so important, but it isn't the whole story of who I am. And so I guess the story of my business is the story of me coming home to myself in the gradual ways that that happens. Like now Reiki is so integrated into my business. I teach it online. I teach it here. I use it in my client work. I have a Reiki practice on the side. Those things didn't exist five years ago. Talking about energetics and the emotions of the body and tuning into our bodies because I wasn't even there yet for myself fully. And so that has changed a lot in terms of what my business actually has on offer has mm -hmm. been a huge change. But also how I show up has completely changed. Even in the last year, I don't often do launches, but I did a launch two years ago and it was successful, but it was like pulling emotional teeth. Like every day was like a battle of like showing up and being like, okay, what's coming up for us today? How are we going to feel into it? How like how are we going to show up and actually sell? Uh, like all of that felt really hard. The perfectionism, the procrastination, the fear of being seen, the fear of being critiqued. All of that goes along with like fear of not belonging anymore. Huge theme in my life. And so this past year, I went to relaunch again and it was a beautiful experience. It took so much less out of me. You know, it wasn't this like crawling across the floor just like where every single post felt so high stakes, where pulling out any kind of expression. I mean, if you look on, at my Instagram, the way I'm expressing myself has completely changed as well as those blocks or I guess the blueprint has emerged more clearly around my whole self-expression. I'm not worried about being cast out anymore or being seen, being in my light. All of that just feels so much easier being in my business feels so much more regenerative and not like, you know, going under the night every night trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to make this work. So those are the biggest, yeah, the biggest changes. Well, that's huge. I mean, that's massive. Oh. It's a, yeah. what, I guess what you, what you're calling your blueprint is really, it's like alignment. Like your mm -hmm. business is a lot, your business and your messaging and your branding and everything is aligned with you, like your true self. Is that mm -hmm. a good interpretation of what that means. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and with that alignment and attunement, it's just like, oh, like, yeah, all of these weights that I was carrying around just seem to have been shed. But that being said, like when you were doing more traditional coaching and then you were thinking about, oh, I really want to bring this Reiki and this more energetic approach into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you have fears come up that you were like, that's crazy. Nobody will buy that. Or like what kind of, because I, I know that's a big sticking point for a lot of people. I know I've wondered that too, as I brought new things into my business, like, can I really do that? <laughs> Did mm -hmm. that happen for you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I think in the early days I was like, too bad, suck it up, <laughs> like <laughs> push through. 
or like, um, especially when it came to like show the mechanics of business, like just show up, just keep doing it, you know, live outside of your comfort zone. And I think that there's some wisdom in those things, but I think I pushed my system too hard. And then when like the business started to come in, I was like, yikes. And I ran and I hid <laughs> because I, my nervous system just wasn't ready for it. It wasn't ready for that kind of expansion because I had just been pushing, pushing, pushing. And so that leads to a, a different kind of burnout. Like it wasn't a, a big, um, like my hair wasn't falling out. It didn't manifest in health issues, but rather just made me afraid to like take the next steps. I just like re-traumatized myself. And so now the approach is like, okay, well, I feel like I want to integrate this new kind of stuff. How can I do that in a really easy, um, like mindful way? Like, what are the baby steps that I can take instead of like, just like throwing myself into the deep end and trying to learn how to swim? Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm over here smiling and nodding because I think we've all been there. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> like yes. those two, the two extremes of just like, totally going for it and like jumping in way over your head. And then the other one of just being like absolutely terrified and exhausted and just having to stop. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, yeah. And nice. that's the trauma response wave, mm. right? In the middle is this beautiful space of being able to be present to ourselves and in alignment. And we have those blips of like, this is kind of scary. Okay, but we can handle it. Instead of going like, this is scary. Hold on for your life. We're doing mm -hmm. it anyway. And then crashing and being like, oh, I've just, wa I've, I've watched Netflix for three days straight. Or like, I've eaten foods this way, or I'm just needing to sleep so much. Um, and, and you talk a lot about seasons in your work and mm -hmm. there are seasons that are live in our bodies and making peace with those seasons too, instead of pushing mm -hmm. through them is a huge part of like reparenting and trauma work. Mm. I love it. Oh, I feel like I could talk about this for ages actually. And I'd <laughs> love to like dig more into this idea of our blueprints and getting aligned with those and energy work and, oh, it's awesome. Anyway, um, so tell people where they can get in touch with you to learn more and work with you and all that good stuff. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram is where I'm most active these days. And that's at Joe Tucker coach. And then you can find me on my website, which is Joe Tucker.com. And I actually prepared like a special little thing talking just about perfectionism and procrastination and business and trauma. And so you can find that at joe-tucker.com slash well printer for you guys. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> we'll link it up in the show notes and share it in our Facebook group and everything so everybody can get it because I think procrastination is going to be a popular topic. Just guessing. But <laughs> welcome I've... to the portal of entrepreneurship, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. Oh, thank you so much. This is such a great conversation. And like you said, like we could just literally talk for hours. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Wellpreneur podcast. As always, you can get all the links in the show notes at wellpreneur.com. And if you would like to shift your life and work into the flow so that you can get more done with ease, I invite you to sign up for my completely free mini course. It's called Find Your Flow. It's six days of bite-sized rituals, remedies, and actions to help you get more done with ease. You don't even have to buckle down, work harder, or have more self-discipline. It's really good stuff. You can sign up for my free mini course at wellpreneur.com slash flow. That's it for me from this week, but have a fantastic week wishing you lots of joy and ease and flow in your life and business. And I will see you back here next week with our next episode. 